Hello and welcome. My name is Monica Salvia and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. It's my privilege to serve graduates of Penn Nursing with programs and events such as today's webinar series. At the end of today's webinar, I will share information about other upcoming programs and opportunities to engage with the school and one another, so please stay tuned. Now let me begin by thanking the alumni, faculty, staff, students, parents, and friends who have all joined us here today. Uh, I can share a little bit about all of you just for fun. There are registrants are from 30 different states in the U.S. as well as from Canada. Most of you work in the hospital clinic and 69% of you are or will soon be Penn Nursing alumni. At today's webinar, I have the unique honor of welcoming all of you to Are You What You Eat? Diet and the Intestinal Microbiome, a webinar sponsored by Penn Nursing alumni and featuring Dr. Charlene Kumpfer. The webinar is scheduled for one hour. So before we get started, we'll go over some of the basics on using the webinar features. Remember, everyone on the call is muted so we can reduce background noise. During the presentation, you can communicate with the organizers about any technology concerns via the chat function, and you can submit questions at any point for Dr. Comfort using the question function. So let's start by looking on the right hand of your screen. You should see the GoToWebinar control panel. This is typically a gray box that, allows, that provides you with information on the webinar functions and ways to interact with me. The red arrow on the box allows you to minimize the box by clicking the arrow pointed to the right, or you can maximize the box by clicking the arrow pointed to the left. So let's start with the control panel in its maximized position. Near the bottom of the box, you should see a section heading titled Questions. This area is where you can type questions for our speaker at any point during the webinar. Dr. Comfort will answer questions, as many of these questions as possible at the end of the presentation. And please note that questions submitted in advance during your registration have been received and do not need to be resubmitted at this time. At the bottom of the control panel box, you should see a section titled Chat. This area is where you can communicate with the organizer about any concerns during the webinar. My team and I will monitor this section for the duration of the webinar, so please feel free to reach out. The final feature I would like to point out is the raised hand function. As an alternate to the chat function, if you need to interact with me during the presentation concerning an issue with the call or another logistical issue, you can virtually raise your hand by clicking on the small hand icon on the left side of the control panel. I'd like to conclude our overview by checking everyone's audio. So if you can hear me, please virtually raise your hand using the hand icon. I'll give everyone a minute to do that. And while you're clicking the hand, I want to remind all of our participants that today's webinar will be recorded and will be made available to you later this week. Okay, thank you. It looks like all of you can hear me. So I will go ahead and clear all those raised hands. And now it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Dr. Charlene Comfer. Charlene Comfer is a professor of nutrition science and the Shear Chair in Healthy Family Practices at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing, as well as the director of the Microbiome-Related Diet Assessment Research and professor of nutrition science for the Penn CHOP Microbiome Program. Dr. Comfer leads the nutrition research staff in the Penn Clinical Translational Research Center, where diet-focused interventions and intake assessments are conducted. For over 15 years, she has been actively involved in clinical research in patients with severe gastrointestinal disease, primarily short bowel syndrome. In her work, she has used a, a range of dietary assessment methods, from inpatient nutrient balance studies to remotely collected dietary intake data to answer key questions linking diet and disease as impacted by the gut biome. In her spare time, Dr. Comfer is faculty director of Penn's nutrition minor and nutrition major. Both are joint programs of the School of Nursing and the School of Arts and Sciences. Through her clinical practice and research, Dr. Comfer has improved the quality of life for people with short bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, and critical illnesses. And today, we have the privilege of learning from her about diet and the intestinal microbiome. Welcome, Dr. Comfer. Let's begin. Thank you very much, Monica, for the lovely introduction. You'll notice that I played with the title just a little bit. I, I added in the word only, and <clears throat> I feel certain that you've been exposed to a public health nutrition campaign trying to link what you eat with your health 
as a way of improving overall dietary practices in the U.S. What I'm going to do today is add in the dimension of the gut microbiome into that story. I'll begin by letting you know I have no conflicts of interest with regard to this presentation. And my research, by and large, is in this general area, specifically in uh, conditions of GI disease, but also preterm birth. To do this today, what I want to do is begin by giving you some useful terminology, because this whole area is only about 10 years old, so a lot of the terminology is new for us. I want to focus on why humans would tolerate having so many microbes living in their gut, and then do a bit of a life course exploration of the gut microbiome, starting with pregnancy, and then how the diet after feeding affects the microbiome. And then finally, just briefly, I'll touch on the gut microbiome and health. The, so what is the gut microbiome? <clears throat> Sometimes it's called the gut microbiota, but it's basically comprised of all single cell organisms that live in the intestinal tract. And there are quite a number and variety of them. Bacterial richness is a concept that I'll use today and that you hear in this area. Richness describes the number of different types of bacteria in a microbiome sample. In general, we believe that high bacterial richness is a good feature that's associated with health and low bacterial richness has been more often associated with metabolic diseases. <clears throat> when we look at microbiome data, this is a piece of big data science. We have so many hundreds and thousands of variables that we need to use statistical methods to bring them into something we can understand. One of the ones we use is called principal components analysis, and I'll show you a series of PCA charts that help us to see where there are similarities and differences in microbiome samples. A heat map is another specific statistical approach, which is basically a color-coded correlation matrix. With the heat map, we can see which variables are going in the same direction as one increases, the other increases, or where they're going in opposite directions. Prebiotics, I suspect you've heard about in the lay press. These are plant carbohydrates that humans don't have the enzyme to digest completely, but the live bacteria living in the GI tract most definitely can. And just for contrast, probiotics in fact, are the live bacteria that you can find in some food products, such as lactobacillus and yogurt, or in uh, probiotic supplements. To begin then, the human microbiome goes beyond the GI tract. In fact, every surface of, in humans has its own microbiome, and they're each distinctive. The figure on the left <clears throat> excuse me, illustrates the proportions of different phyla of bacteria at each of these types of surfaces. And you can see that the proportions vary greatly, even though the members are somewhat similar. I circled the gastrointestinal tract because that's our topic for today, but it's a really important one for me and for you because these bugs in the GI tract are the ones that come into direct contact with the food that you eat. Believe it or not, there are about 100 trillion bacterial cells in your GI tract. They have about 150 times more DNA than we do in our genome. They're massive. We've learned this only in the past 10 to 15 years because only 40% of them can be grown 
in culture. So this means that we had to have high throughput DNA technology, which was developed as part of the human microbiome project to be able to identify these. How do we identify them? Well, we take a human microbiome sample. The ones I'm talking about today are stool samples. You extract all the DNA from the sample, and then you compare the DNA to establish databases. With these databases, looking at the left side of this slide, we can identify which organisms are present and their relative proportion. When we look at microbiome work, it's important to think about this is a community of players living in your GI tract. It's very rare that you would have only a single one. So we want to know what is the community there, how much is there, what's there, and what's their relative abundance. And then we can measure small molecules in the same sample. We can measure in urine samples. We can measure in blood. And we compare these molecules to known databases so that we can identify metabolites. When we think about metabolites, the ones you know about are the uh, lipid profile you're more used to looking at. That's the metabolite of the fat that you've eaten. But there are many, many more. Our metabolomic profiles today give us maybe 700 different metabolites. But what these tell us is the functions of the community. So we know what's there, in what proportion, and what they can do. This is team science. It's big data science. And it takes a number of individuals exquisitely trained. Our team in the Penn Shop Microbiome Program is led by um, physicians, Dr. Gary Wu and Jim Lewis. They're gastroenterologists. They do both clinical trials, and also animal work that backs up the translational aspect here. I need the nutrition assessment component. We have one lab that does all of the microbiome analyses, and our biostatistician is one of the most important players just because of the dimensions of the data. There are also a huge group of trainees at all levels involved with this work. Why would we have all of these bugs living in our gut? It happens, we don't think about this tube that goes from your mouth to your anus as being a, a wonderful ecological niche, but it certainly is for bacteria. Consider the fact that it's dark, it's pH adjusted depending on where in the GI tract you are. It's warm. And food comes in at regular intervals. What could be worse? What could be better for bacteria? And if you don't eat food, then the bacteria can get nutrition from the mucus layer lining the bowel. Well, that's the bacterial side. What's the benefit to the host? These bacteria help us to break down carbohydrates when there are components that we don't have the enzyme for. And when they do that, they produce short-chain fatty acids, which are a beneficial effect on overall GI tract health. They help us break down nitrogen from protein foods. We've known for many years that they synthesize certain vitamins. Now we're learning that they may synthesize even more than we knew about before. Bile acids that we use to digest fat in our, from our diet can become toxic, and they help us break them down. They help us metabolize drugs. But perhaps one of the most important functions that we're still clarifying is their effect on educating the immune system at the level of the GI tract. Starting with pregnancy then, what happens to the gut microbiome during pregnancy? If you can focus on this figure on the right, this is the principal components analysis chart. And the orange dots are first trimester uh, stool samples from women. The gray dots are from the third trimester from the same women. And then we have black dots that are human microbiome programs 
male controls, the peep dots are hu human microbiome program female controls. So it's pretty easy to see that the first trimester sample clump all together down in the corner of the lower left. Um, <coughs> They also are in a general quadrant of the normal human uh, male and female microbe samples. So we believe that the microbial diversity at the first trimester of pregnancy is pretty much normal. But look at the gray dots from the third trimester of pregnancy. The scatter is considerable. This means that the women, <clears throat> even though a few of them remained close to the samples that they had in the first trimester, most of them have, are showing a lot more diversity, more differences from one to the other, and they're moving further away from the normal controls. So why would we have third trimester of pregnancy samples becoming so different from the first trimester. One of the ways with microbiome work that we study this is by transferring microbiome samples from humans into germ-free mice. Germ-free mice have been raised without exposure to any microbes, so they have no microbes in their gut. And if you look at the figures on the right, what happens the orange bars are the uh, first trimester, and the gray bars are the third trimester. The um, figure B is showing us various biomarkers of an inflammatory response. So it's pretty easy to see that the third trimester biomarkers, by and large, are increased. So there's an increased inflammatory response going on. The Figure C shows you the increase in adiposity over a two-week time window, and these are <clears throat> these are mice, so they grow more quickly, but there's significantly greater increase in adiposity in the third trimester mouse recipients, and their blood sugar levels are also higher. So why would the microbiome of third trimester pregnant women be inducing increased adiposity and increased blood sugar with an inflammatory response. The interpretation that we make is this is probably a real um, important advantage. The task of the woman during the third trimester of pregnancy is to shift calories to the fetus. The fetus needs to be gaining weight. So having higher blood sugar to be able to shift calories is advantageous. On the other hand, the woman needs to store fat so that she can support breastfeeding after delivery. However, we all know that in susceptible women, gestational diabetes may be identified right about this time. What happens to the mother's microbiome after pregnancy, and what about the baby? The figure on the left shows you, again, the first trimester and third trimester. You can see a great difference in the two samples. But look, the purple bar adds one month postpartum, and the, uh, there's essentially no difference. There's no statistical difference, and you can see visually no difference between the third trimester and one month postpartum. What about the baby at one month and six months of age? You can see that their microbiome is closer in similarity to the mother's third trimester than it is to her first trimester. But by age four, the baby's microbiome is similar. The ch young child's microbiome is similar to mom's. This is because by the age of four, mom and four-year-old have a pretty similar diet. But there's another feature that can affect the microbiome at pregnancy, and that is the mode of delivery. If you look at the principal components chart on the right one more time, the pale blue dots are the babies who were delivered by cesarean section, and the pale pink 
are vaginal delivered. Um, <clears throat> the mother's microbiome uh, samples, the red or vaginal microbiome, and the blue are skin. So one thing you can see in the right-hand corner is that babies who were born by cesarean section, the baby's microbiome samples, their skin, their stool samples, are very similar to the mother's skin samples. And this is because the baby didn't pass through the birth canal. On the other hand, those delivered by uh, vaginal approach have, have microbiome very similar to the mother's vaginal flora. This is an important finding and has impacted to some degree the approaches to exposing um, cesarean delivered babies to the mother's vaginal microbiome. However, the effect is fairly short-lived and outpaced by the effects of food and type of feeding. If you look at this figure, the diet in the first nine months of life is either breastfeeding or formula feeding. We know that babies who are breastfed are exposed to about 700 different microbes. Needless to say, formula feeding provides far fewer. There are some data suggesting that formula feeding, when it has prebiotics added, has more similar gut microbiome in the baby than, than um, unsupplemented formula feeding. However, the major feature of the micro, gut microbiome at this point in a newborn's life is really that it's in constant flux. It's not a stable microbiome. When we begin to advance the diet, we wean the milk source down and begin to introduce table food. Then the bacterial composition changes and there's more flux. Um, there is a greater intake of fruits and vegetables are pretty typical for food. And those require bacteria that are able to break those fiber in those foods down and produce butyrate, which is one of the beneficial short-chain fatty acids. Fast forward to about 36 months where toddlers are eating finger food and eating more normal food. The microbiome begins to become more stable and by age three to four years, it's really very similar to the microbiome of the rest of the family. <clears throat> we have two typical poles, we call them enterotypes of microbes that are linked with dietary styles. If you look at the figure on the left, the bacteroides pole is more often seen in individuals who have a diet high in protein and fat and not so much plant polysaccharides. The right-hand pole, Prevotella pole, is high in plant polysaccharides in the diet and relatively low in protein and fat. And many of us eat both styles or some mixed diet called, we call it omnivorous, and we are somewhere in the middle. The figure on the right is data from our group, Dr. Wu, showing these two poles in um, people with a normal diet. And I'll show you a little more about that. These are, this is your first heat map. So in this heat map, I know you can't read this, but the rows are specific nutrients. And there is 160 of them. The columns are the phyla of bacteria, and we have labeled bacteroides and Prevotella at the top. When the colors are closer to red, it's a positive correlation, meaning when the bacteria, <clears throat> when the intake of a particular food is greater, there's a greater proportion of that bacteria present. The blue is a negative association. So if you look at the bacteroides, you can see the red, a positive association, in the amino acids and fats. So when the diet has more protein and fats in it, you'll see greater
greater proportion of bacteroides in the gut microbiome sample. By contrast, when there's less amino acids and fat, you see more Prevotella. But if you look at the top right, you see all this pink around carbohydrates and there's vitamins up there too. So a more plant-based diet is, will have more Prevotella in the microbiome sample. The adult microbiome, by contrast to the infant microbiome, is in a steady state. We know this because during controlled feeding, the diet changes. When you change someone's diet very radically, um, <clears throat> these data are from, excuse me, are from the feeding trial where <clears throat> we took people from their usual diet and then put them on either a high fat, low fiber diet or low fat, high fiber diet. And <clears throat> the principal components plot shows you their microbiome data. The first day is different from the rest, but the same color reflects the same person. You can also see by the figure at the bottom, the B figure shows you the subjects on the low fat diet and the first day is very different from all the other days. So day one, in response to this new radical change in diet, the microbiome changes, and then it goes right back to your normal. To understand this further, we did a study in vegans and omnivores. Now these vegans had followed a plant-based diet, no animal products, for at least two years, and the omnivores said we eat plants and animal foods together. You can see at the top, this is a principal components plot showing the diet in the vegans in green and the omnivores in purple. And you can see that they are totally separate from each other. There's no overlap at all. If you wondered about that, the heat map below gives you the green vegans and the purple omnivores. And it's pretty easy to see that where the vegans are blue, the omnivores are red, and vice versa. And the biggest differences in this heat map really are in uh, protein and fat are much greater in the omnivores. And there's much greater intake of vitamins, carbohydrates, and plant chemicals, phytochemicals in the vegans. That said, the gut microbiota, when we looked at that composition, it really didn't separate. There was a lot of mixing, and the changes were really very mild, especially relative to the context of the differences in diet. And then we had plasma samples, so we did a metabolomics profile, and lo and behold, there were 30 plasma metabolites that could distinguish an omnivore from a vegan with great accuracy. These metabolites are by and large amino acid or fat related compounds or vitamins. It gets more interesting. There were a number of metabolites of plant phenolic compounds that were only seen in vegans to a significant degree. And these are particularly interesting because they're significantly higher. The vegan has to have eaten the right precursor food and to have the uh, bacteria in the bowel to digest them because some of these can only be produced from microbial origin. Humans cannot produce them. To help you understand how diet and the microbiome could have an effect on disease, I'd like to just walk you through this cartoon. If you start at the top, this is the gut lumen, the inside of the tube, and those squiggly creatures are various kinds of bacteria living there. You see the mucus layer that's to protect the epithelial cells from invasion by these microbes, and then beneath we have inflammatory and immune cells. If a rogue microbe somehow gets through the mucus layer 
and the epithelial cells, there can be an immune response. The B cells cause the secretion of secretory IgA or a pro-inflammatory response. However, if these bacteria break down complex carbohydrates and fiber for us to produce short-chain fatty acids like butyrate, then we get an anti-inflammatory response. So the current thinking is that some of the diet disease relationship may be linked to this kind of pathway. It's also important to bear in mind that not only does the food you eat come into contact with your microbiome, but so do any antibiotics you take orally or other drugs to produce metabolites that we can then measure in your bloodstream. We've known most, most uh, about the digestion of dietary fiber by microbes. We know that they break them down to short-chain fatty acids, and short-chain fatty acids are the preferred fuel of the cells in the colon. But we've learned more recently that they also have a role in cell signaling, and in fact, in regulatory T cells, reducing intestinal inflammation. So this is an important pathway that we're focused on, especially in patients with GI disease. These are the short list of uh, diseases that have been associated with the gut microbiome. And you notice diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, colon cancer. These are all, both there are animal data and some human data. In inflammatory bowel disease, there is has been recognized a dysbiosis, which just means an altered microbiome in some individuals, but not all individuals. What's interesting is that all of these involve both a genetic risk and an environmental factor. We don't always think of our diet as being an environment, but the diet is part of the environment that the bugs living in the gut are dealing with, as well as your intestinal cells. All of these conditions are associated with inflammation. They have increased very rapidly over the last few decades, and we see them much more often in industrialized nations, many associated with diet. What I'm hoping to do today is to fill in the blanks here. You've known for some time that your dietary intake is associated with disease. I'm sure in your nutrition courses you were told that when you eat saturated fat, you'll have a higher cholesterol, higher LDL and total cholesterol, and that's associated with cardiovascular disease. What we're doing now is putting in the data from altered gut bacteria as a result of the dietary, or in response to the dietary intake, and then looking at what are the biologic effects, specifically what's going on with pro and anti-inflammatory and the immune system. This could be our vegan data, because vegans only have plant proteins and no animal protein. What I want you to notice on this figure is the differences in the microbiota in those two, in response to those two types of protein. The plant protein diet is associated with increased short chain fatty acids, which are generally anti inflammatory and protective of the GI tract. On the other hand, the animal proteins are associated with lower concentrations of short chain fatty acids and occasionally with some. Uh, compounds like trimethylamine oxide that are known to be toxic to the heart. We need to know a lot more about this, obviously. Saturated fats, we know, are associated with um, insulin sensitivity problems with type 2 diabetes, and there is also an inflammatory response that we've known about. We also know that unsaturated fats are associated with different bacterial species and with reduction.
reductions in total and LDL cholesterol. These pathways are all being worked on today. As a nutritionist, my goal in this work is to find dietary patterns because people don't say, today I'm eating calcium, tomorrow I'm eating sodium. We think we eat a full diet. So the eating styles also need to be evaluated. The Western diet has been associated with a totally different microbial profile, and these are some of the pictures of the most high-fat, high-protein versions. Um, also associated with cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, all inflammatory processes. By contrast, the Mediterranean diet is associated with a different microbial profile and with reduction in the same outcome. Gluten-free diet is very popular today, and we know more about the bacterial profile, but we know nothing about the associated health outcomes. So just to summarize my main points for you today, it's important to realize that the gut microbiome remodels itself during the course of pregnancy, and for very good reasons. We want to support the growth of the fetus, and we also want to be able to feed the babies after they're born. In, in infants, the development of a microbiome in a stable fashion takes three to four years, and by that point, it resembles mom's microbiome. And we believe the reason is that the gut microbiome is so responsive to the food intake. By contrast to the infant microbiome, adult microbiomes are very stable. That said, they're also very varied depending on the usual diet of the individual. The gut microbiome may well play a role in health or disease through activating these immune or inflammatory pathways. I want to thank you very much for your kind attention and see what questions we may have. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Cooper. So at this time, I invite our attendees to feel free to submit questions through that questions box on your screen. Um, we do have several that have come in already and in advance that we want to, uh, to ask at this time. So the first question is, um, Dr. Cooper, are there measures to diagnose the health of your bio? That's a great question, and it's a hard one to answer. Um, we believe that a more diverse microbiome, one that has increased richness, is generally associated with a healthier condition. Um, problems like obesity and diabetes have been associated with decreased microbial richness. That said, it's hard to get a microbiome sample assays if you're not in a research program, and when you do, if you get the data, they're incredibly difficult to interpret. So I think having a measure of the health of your microbiome is a future goal, but I don't think we're there quite yet. <clears throat> so um, then given the benefits that you've shown us about plant-based diet on the microbiome, are there benefits to consuming animal-based products besides B12? Well, this is, question is from someone who knows <laughs> that when people follow a purely plant-based diet, uh, as uh, vegans, for example, they're at risk of vitamin B12 deficiency because that nutrient is only provided from animal sources. So it's very important to get vitamin B12. It's also challenging from a vegan diet to get enough iron in the diet, and it's much easier to get adequate iron intake with even small portions of animal food. Vegan diets also are very high in fiber, and some of the micronutrients such as iron, calcium, are bound to some of the fiber in the bowel and lost. So if you were a person who 
had a higher need for iron if you were still having your menstrual cycle, for example. That's a bit harder to manage on a completely vegan diet. So then we have several questions coming in related to Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, and, and then um, the impact of plant-based diet. Okay. Yes. So my group at Penn, Dr. Wu and Dr. Jim Lewis are gastroenterologists, and we are especially interested in inflammatory bowel disease. We've done the studies we've done in normal, healthy volunteers to give us kind of baseline data with which we can compare the inflammatory bowel disease. We did a study in children who were treated, had active Crohn's disease, and I didn't show you these data today, but they were treated with enteral feedings, with tube feedings basically, or with um, anti-TNF antibodies. And what was very interesting about it is when we looked at their microbiome, about a third of them had a strong dysbiosis that you could identify clearly as very different from normal controls. But about two-thirds of the children with Crohn's disease who had active Crohn's disease and were going for treatment um, had microbiota that was not distinguishable from normal. We're still trying to understand this, and there are studies ongoing as we speak in children with very early onset Crohn's disease. So I think that in a matter of time, we'll know much more about this whole area than we do right now. But it's a very important one because what we're looking for is a possibility of a treatment effect that we could ameliorate with the microbiome. We know very little, almost nothing, about the effects of plant foods in inflammatory bowel diseases. We know that inflammatory bowel disease is associated with lower levels of butyrate, which is the beneficial short-chain fatty acid. So you would think that a plant-based diet would be a good thing. But when people have active Crohn's disease, they don't want to eat fruits and vegetables because they get more GI symptoms and they don't feel well. Um, and we're not sure which came first, backing off the fruits and vegetables or the low um, butyrate levels. More to come on that. It's a topic that is going to be really important for us to resolve in the future. That's a great question. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, so I'm going to switch gears for one second. We have a number of questions that have come in uh, that I'm going to Dr. Cooper a chance to look at. But I just want to give a little plug and let folks know that we have a number of other events coming up. So I'm going to invite all of our alumni and students to join us. Homecoming is only a couple of weeks away, November 3rd and 4th. And in addition to the football game, I hope you'll consider taking uh, part in some of the educational um, and other engaging events. So we have our annual nurse networking event. It's on Saturday morning the 4th, and there will be a conversation later that afternoon with Dean Beerwell and the, some of the Presidential Engagement Prize winners. So I have uh, two more questions here that I want to ask, and then we'll get to some of the other ones that have come in. And feel free to please uh, keep submitting, folks, if you have questions on the line. So the next question is about probiotics. Are there good ones there? We'll see you back in a minute. Um, and probiotics are always a very interesting topic. In general, it seems that it would be helpful to take probiotics. We, the research base is so limited that I really can't make a recommendation. And I would not um, recommend one product over another regardless because we need to be independent. But really, the reason I don't is because the data are not clear enough, not adequate. Sadly. Yes, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so how long until the microbiome shifts or does it change appetite? Um, so I showed you a little bit of data from a feeding trial where we changed the diet radically 
increasing the amount of fiber and, and decreasing the amount of fat or increasing the protein and, and uh, fat and reducing the fiber. In those cases, the microbiome changed on day one and then it bounced right back to the normal even though the diet was continued for 10 days. So people, adult people, have a microbiome that is steady as a rock and individual. So mine is not the same as yours, Monica, or yours out there, um, but it's pretty stable. So what can change our microbiome more than a very radical change in diet? Taking antibiotics can change your microbiome because you're basically killing a bunch of them. But then after a period of time, it comes back to your norm. And part of that is probably because we're fairly habitual in the food that we eat. Most people eat more or less the same thing for breakfast every morning or within a choice of one or two things and about the same thing for lunch. Dinner varies, but dinner, if you're a vegan, is one style. If you're an omnivore, it's another. And so we, we really reinforce our usual microbes, and they help us because they know what they need to be able to digest for us. Um. So some of the questions here that have come in, okay, I can start from this right here. So um, can you talk a little bit about the concept of leaky gut? So leaky gut is a really interesting concept that we have talked about, especially in inflammatory bowel disease, but we also talk about it in critical care. And the, in critical care, the theories go round and round. One of the things we know about leaky gut is that the butyrate level can influence that. Um, <clears throat> when the butyrate level goes up, the short-chain fatty acid butyrate, the tight junctions in the gut get tighter, so they basically squeeze to protect um, microbes, for example, from going through. Leaky gut means that a microbe or some Fragments of a microbe are passing through the bowel into the bloodstream, and it's not a good thing. It's not what we want. So a higher fiber diet produces more butyrate. Plant polysaccharides produce more butyrate from the bacteria that live there, and that's generally beneficial to leaky gut. That said, you don't always tolerate a high fiber diet if you're really sick. If you're in the ICU, you may not want a high fiber diet. If your Crohn's disease is in flare, you may not want uh, whole wheat bread with cracked wheat berries in it. That may not go well. So more on this in the future, hopefully. Artificial sweeteners. Great. So let's talk a little bit about artificial sweeteners and what impact they have. Um, there are accumulating data about sugars, regular sweeteners, and their impact on the gut microbiome. And then there's a study or two about artificial sweeteners. And this work is a work in progress, but we know that with a high sugar intake, the gut microbiome, when you transplant gut microbial samples into germ-free mice, you get increased problems with uh, diabetes and also weight gain, sort of similar to the figures I showed you with the pregnancy samples from the third trimester. The um, artificial sweeteners seem to have similar responses and we're not sure why, but one clue may be that the, t the taste receptors, we think of taste receptors being in our mouth because that's how we can taste sweet or bitter or sour. 
but there are actually taste receptors lining your whole GI tract. And those same taste receptors that recognize sweet, that recognize sugar, also recognize artificial sweeteners. What we don't know fully is what happens after that. So once again, this is a work in progress. I hope I'm not frustrating people too much. We really want nutrition to be crystal clear. We want the answer today, and we want it to be the same thing tomorrow that it is today. And I cannot help but believe that this science is vitally important and none of the baseline relationships that you have been taught about nutrition have changed. No one is coming to the point of saying, eat more saturated fats because it's good for your heart. The end results are the same. It's just we're adding layers of understanding so that we can really describe this entire pathway. And we want to do that so that we can customize um, dietary advice and treatment for affected individuals. Absolutely. So I think that's a, a, a good plug for staying tuned. Right. And staying connected for more uh, research and more information coming in the future. So thank you again, Dr. Cooper. I, I really appreciate all the, um, the insights you've given us today and the time that you've spent with us. For our attendees, again, thank you for joining us. I do want to mention that our next webinar is February 1st. It will be with Dean Deerwell. We certainly invite you to take uh, part in that one. You'll see emails about that soon. And I mentioned homecoming. We also have a number of targeted events coming up. We have an event on aging, which will take place in Lehigh Valley in a couple weeks. We have graduate program reunions for our administration and health leadership groups, as well as one for anesthesia. Those are all in November, so get them on your calendar soon. And then, of course, there are many more things happening. We have a film screening, um, so many things in the next couple of weeks and throughout the rest of the year. So please check the calendar on the Penn Nursing website. And in conclusion, I invite you to uh, consider getting involved with Penn Nursing alumni. The programs that we have and the opportunities that exist are because of alumni like you, parents and friends who get involved and uh, support our community. So no matter where you live, the school really depends on those who volunteer their time to interview students, uh, to plan and promote events, to share job postings, to offer support through social media, uh, submit award nominations, and so much more. Uh, and that's not limited to alumni. We have many in our community who can help in all these ways. So I invite you to contact the alumni office for more information and uh, respond to the post-webinar survey to provide your feedback. So thank you again for taking part in today's webinar, and thank you, Dr. Cooper. Have a good day.